court. Back in the day, in Federalist Number 78, Alexander Hamilton wrote at some length, this, uh, the Federalist Papers were a series of uh, newspaper articles that were published in, mostly in the summer, of, uh, summer and fall of 1787 and through 1788, uh, in the, excuse me, in the fall and winter of 1787 and throughout 1788, that were basically sales pitches to the states to ratify the Constitution, which happened in 1789, and that's when we officially became the modern United States of America, and George Washington got elected, and the Supreme Court was created, and all that kind of, by Congress, and all that kind of stuff. It's interesting, by the way, the Supreme Court did not exist at the creation of our country. The, the Constitution does not create a Supreme Court. Article three of the Constitution gives Congress the power to create the Supreme Court, which they did, uh, which I, you know, I find fascinating. In any case, Alexander Hamilton argued strongly, and it's in the Constitution, I mean, he argued successfully as well, that Supreme Court justices should be on the court for life. He calls it permanency in office. And he said the, the reason why, well, he said it, uh, there, the, uh, uh, nothing can contribute so much to the court's firmness and independence as permanency in office. This quality may therefore be justly regarded as an indispensable agreement, I, uh, ingredient in its constitution, and in a great measure as the citadel of the public justice and the public security. He goes on to say, if then the courts of justice are to be considered as the bulwarks of a limited constitution against legislative encroachments, this consideration will afford a strong argument for the permanent tenure of judicial offices, since nothing will contribute so much as this to that independent spirit in the judges, which must be essential to the faithful per performance of so arduous a duty. The whole point, in other words, was if we give judges lifetime tenure, so they no longer have to rely on a political party, they no longer have to rely on political donors, they no longer have to re rely on the, on, the, on the support of partisan newspapers, then they will do what they believe is right, rather than what you know, helps their friends or helps them or helps their political party. And by the way, that's how it was right up until pretty much the, the Reagan era. You know, for example, they, I, I give a couple of examples in the article. The first one is uh, Earl Warren. Earl Warren was the vice presidential candidate on the Thomas Dewey ticket running against Harry Truman in 1948. And most people probably, you know, are obviously are not old enough to even remember that, but, but, but most people don't even realize Earl Warren was, you know, ran for vice president of the United States on the Republican ticket. Before that, he had been the three-term governor of California. Very, very popular governor. Before that, he was California's attorney general, and he was a complete hard ass. He was a total law and order guy. He was a lifelong Republican. He was the Republican governor of California. And before he was the attorney general, he was the district attorney for Alameda County, where he delighted in throwing people in jail. He had a reputation as being a really tough, very conservative prosecutor. That was Earl Warren. So, you know, uh, when, and in fact, Richard Nixon, in the 1952 Republican nominating convention, Richard Nixon, then the senator from California, put in the nomination of Earl Warren for president. Now, it ended up going to Eisenhower. Eisenhower, you know, won the election of 52 with Nixon as his vice president. But everybody agreed, Earl Warren was one tough, law and order, right-wing Republican. So, you know, that was Eisenhower's first appointment to the Supreme Court, was Earl Warren. Let's put, it, let's put this guy on the court. He's a forceful law and order guy. And what happens? Well, the first decision, the first major decision that the, came before the court in 1953, uh, the, the ruling was, you know, issued in the spring of, of uh, 54, was Brown versus Board of Education. And in Brown versus Board of Education, the, the Supreme Court and Earl Warren, uh, there were only two dissenters in this case. It was, it was a seven to two decision. And Earl Warren got the whole, basically the whole court to go along with them and say, yeah, you know, we can no longer have segregated, racially segregated public schools in America. Thus began the whole charter school thing, the whole private school thing, the whole Christian Academy thing, 
and the and and also uh, you know Fred Koch's uh, Fred Koch you know the father of David and Charles Koch um, who was a big patron of the John Birch Society helped fund you know Save Our Republic impeach Earl Warren posters uh, billboards all across America but you know that didn't stop Earl Warren that was that was 1954 then uh, following that he recognized the right to privacy it had never been acknowledged in in the history of the United States under the fourth, fourth amendment he recognized that and struck down the Connecticut law this was in the Griswold case struck down the Connecticut law making it illegal to possess birth control in Connecticut including condoms then in the Engel versus Vitale case he eliminated prayer in public schools then in the Miranda case he said that you have the right not to speak to police and they can't beat a confession out of you then in the uh, Gideon uh, v Wainwright case he said you have the right to a free defense lawyer I mean every single one of these cases just made made uh, conservatives and Republicans just go nuts right and then after that he struck down laws against interracial marriage that was the Loving v Virginia case he ended in a, a form of extreme gerrymandering they used to say okay you know this little county with just a few people in it gets one representative and this huge county with lots of people in it gets another representative and Earl Warren said, and the court said no no you have to have equal numbers of people in other words once he became independent he became a liberal or at least what conservatives would define as a liberal I'd say a constitutionalist the same thing happened with William J Brennan who was you know another conservative he was a staunch Catholic uh, he was confirmed by every Republican in the Senate except for Joe McCarthy. He had, uh, he'd never been a politician, but his judicial record was really tough. He was so conservative that the National Liberal League, which was the largest organization of liberals and progressives in the nation back in, in, in the day, opposed, vigorously opposed his nomination. And Eisenhower thought, oh yeah, if the National Liberty League hates this guy, I love him. He puts Brennan on the court, and Brennan again becomes one of the most liberal justices. Then Jerry Ford nominates uh, John Paul Stevens in 1975. John Paul Stevens, you know, famously dissented to Citizens United, famously dissented to Bush v. Gore. Uh, you know, again, be, became, and, and, and in fact, he wrote the Chevron versus uh, NRDC case, which is where the Chevron deference came out of, which I talked about last week. This is the, the, the doctrine that the Supreme Court created that said that you know if if a if a regulatory agency hires scientists and comes up with something and says this is how it should be then that's how it should be the court should defer to them thus the deference so yeah John Paul Stevens and then and then of course uh, you know finally George Herbert Walker Bush uh, put David Souter on the bench and David Souter that you know who John Sununa the Republican governor of New Hampshire which is where uh, Souter was from said it'll be a home run for conservatives and what did Souter do well you know he uh, he, he he voted in Planned Parenthood versus Casey in favor of abortion rights for women and he joined John Paul Stevens in opposing the courts handing the 2000 election to George W Bush even though he lost the election by 500,000 votes so what happened was after after these four guys got on the court the the the, the billionaire class the right-wing billionaires were like we can't let this happen again and they started pouring money into the Federalist Society and other groups that would make sure that judges were genuine conservatives now, all these guys were actually genuine conservatives at the time they were put on the bench but more importantly that once people get on the bench that there would be a steady regular daily weekly monthly whatever flow of money to them John Roberts wife made over 10 million dollars Amy Coney Barrett's husband's law firm is now booming and he's getting rich off it uh, Sam Alito travels to Europe for luxury trips and gets huge speaking fees and you know don't get me started on Clarence Thomas make sure that there's a steady flow of money and gifts to these guys to keep them conservative and this has corrupted the court and the corrupted court is now corrupting American democracy so we've got to do something about this I think the things we have to do are fairly straightforward we need to number one we need to expand the court uh, number two uh, you know we need to make exceptions to what the court can rule on to 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 say to basically reverse Citizens United 
united and say corporations aren't people. Uh, we, we need to do something about the shadow docket. I mean, there's a bunch of things that can be done. But, you know, as Adam Schiff said, our nation's highest court is not a conservative court because a conservative court would have respect for precedent. And this court doesn't. This is a radical, reactionary court. And Congress needs to do something about it. Obviously, it's not going to happen this year, but we need to get ready for after the next election.